deep scientist friend that it was February 24th last year. And at that point, um, we were talking about sleep deprivation basically being a national emergency. And it was getting worse, even though we were working from home. And now we've gone another year. Who saw this coming? <laughs> <laughs> now we've gone another year. And, and it was really interesting. Some of the stuff that uh, you said you wanted to talk about. I did a little research. We're, uh, I called this episode running on empty because our, our reserves are getting depleted. And I say our collectively. I know some people are doing better than others. But what's going on with people right now that is sapping them of whatever little strength they had left? You know, I love that you use the word collectively because we are collectively going through something huge. Um, I hate the term unprecedented as much as I hate work-life balance. You know, these buzzwords that tend to pop up in times of crisis are are annoying because we think <laughs> we're, we're above this, right? Well, right. sadly, uh, no, none of us are above this extended period of uncertainty. Human beings are not meant to live through extended periods of uncertainty. We need to solve our own problems. We need to find solutions to issues. So when there's nothing but uncertainty all the time, we just don't do well. So now we have this new concept of surge capacity, which has been brilliantly explained by a lot of psychologists, psychologists, um, uh, psychological uh, researchers, all these people who have been doing all this work through this pandemic that we so desperately need. So when we think about surge capacity, if you do research this, one thing that you may find online is that it kind of references hospitals right away. Uh, and that is because when we think about what kind of influx a specific uh, facility can take as far as patients go, you know, that we will reach a capacity. But we as humans have that as well. Our surge capacity is what we dip into when we are in times of crisis. Uh, but this really does work at its very best when this crisis that we enter is uh, short term. It is something that's acute and then yeah. we solve that problem and then we exit it. Uh, so now we are in year two of all of COVID and this pandemic uh, insanity. And so we depleted our surge capacity immediately. As soon as we entered COVID, we all said, all right, we have to do what we have to do. And uh, we started working from home. We started uh, teaching our children online. Uh, we started wearing masks and you know, we did what we had to do and it was supposed to be over. And now it's not. And that's why we all feel so crappy right now. We pulled from our stores and now they're empty. Most of us aren't refilling it. Yeah, that, you know, I, I like how you kind of preface that because we, this is this is an instinctual ability we have as humans. I mean, we can, and I know Karen would agree with me that we've often said, you know, I operate best in moments of chaos because it seems to kind of fire you up. It gets your energy levels up. You have to be on point, mm -hmm. but that's for a little while, you know. <laughs> and then you, you know, it's nice to be able to take a breather. And and I think um, you also mentioned uncertainty, and I'm glad you mentioned uncertainty because I think a lot of people um, oftentimes mislabel us as unable to handle change. I think we're very able to handle change, uh, change where we know maybe what the final outcome is going to be or uh, what we're working towards. And here it just seems like the, the goalposts move so much that it's so frustrating. It's very frustrating. And I think I would speak for either side. I'm not even talking about politically or ideologically. I just think there's some people who are living in a lot more anxiety right now than others. But even the like we are, we're in Texas, we're, you know, we're living basically like we were pre pandemic, to be honest with you. Um, but it's still as frustrating to us. It's just for different reasons. You know, I mean, we're not scared, scared so much as we are just God, exhausted with it. Tired of it. Exhausted. <laughs> That's the perfect word. And everything that we've been going through is exhausting. It's exhausting having that goalpost move. It's exhausting saying, even if you are living with, you know, doors open. I'm in, in Minnesota. It's very different. We have a, a vaccine requirement to eat in restaurants right now. Whoa. Yes. Uh, in That's Minneapolis. I'm exhausted. I'm vaccinated and I'm still exhausted. I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. So when we think about all of the different things that are our variables throughout our day, it so severely impacts our night that we're all suffering so much more. I remember talking last year about how, wow, this is really something none of us have been through before and, and we're so tired. Tack on another 365 <laughs> days. It's getting to a point where even me, the sleep expert, I'm just sick of it and it causes me to lay awake at night. So I absolutely understand that everybody is not only uh, going through this thing that is uh, new, but it feels like it shouldn't be anymore. And yet every day is a new 
H E double toothpicks. <laughs> it is. It's it's crazy. And I think um, you know, we're we're doing all we can to cope. And I think we got past the part of where we can cope. And you mentioned we're we're maybe out of our reserves. We're uh, or I said running on empty. Mm-hmm. Um I read uh, you know, some of your stuff and some of the stuff from some of the your peers that were on there, and there are ways we can refill our tank. Absolutely. Yes, we need to start. Uh, now that if we are listening to this, uh, we're aware that we do have these tanks, we do have these reserves, yours is probably empty. That is the best news you're probably going to get this week is that we can refill it. Uh, there are minor tweaks and changes that we can add to our day that really will help us not only feel better, uh, but give us the ability to have that restorative sleep so that we can continue uh, battling through these times. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because I, I wrote down three things, how we can fill it back up based on uh, what I read. And uh, this also ties into, you mentioned the three pillars are nutrition, exercise, and sleep. I wrote that down last time you were with us. Nutrition, everybody is pretty cognizant of. we got to eat right and exercise. we got to exercise. Everybody forgets sleep. Sleep is just what you do when you're too tired to watch another episode of Ozark. You know, it's just, here we go. All right, I got to go to sleep. But... Uh, When I started concentrating on that more, and I know uh, my wife did as well, we started having a little bit more regular time where we would shut it down. And things like that go a long way. But I kind of went around the farm there. When you fill it back up, the first thing you I wrote down is you got to reassess your priorities and be less demanding of ourselves. I think that was interesting. Do you think that we're being too hard on ourselves right now because of what's going on? Because we don't know what to do and maybe we're just you know, we're feeling, I don't know, disappointed in ourselves or insecure or something of that nature. 100%. You know, we are in the Pinterest era or or the Instagram era where everybody posts the very best parts of their life. So, Mm -hmm. you know, comparison is the, the quickest path to unhappiness. When we see everybody else pretending to succeed at things that maybe we are unable to succeed at, whether it be getting your children out of their pajamas for the day or, you know, cooking a, a healthy meal. Most of us are unable to do all of the things. We cannot uh, provide for our families, uh, make perfectly healthy meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, get eight hours of sleep, uh, and entertain social lives, uh, continue to have perfect relationships. All of that is false. And we know this, and yet we see it on Instagram and on Pinterest that some people appear to be able to accomplish this. Uh, so now that being said, when we are hard on ourselves, a lot of it does come down to comparison. If we are still being hard on ourselves as we continue through COVID, that's my biggest piece of advice right now is to stop because we really just need to survive. Everybody just survive. You don't have to do it well. (laughs) You don't have to do it in a very impressive or even put together way. Just make sure that you are um, happy, healthy. Your family is cared for. That's really all that matters right now is um, having that uh, love and affection and support to continue to go day to day. And if we want to excel at life when we are post pandemic, awesome. We'll try then. But right now, stop being hard on yourself and just get through each day. Because with that ease, with letting up on yourself, that actually literally frees up space in our bodies for other things like uh, compassion, which leads to sleep initiating hormones. When we do have the ability to get rid of more negativity, uh, the positive things that our bodies are trying to create that allow us to relax will help us sleep more. So our ability to be compassionate helps us uh, be healthier and sleep better. Is that right? It really does. It's fascinating. Compassion and gratitude are two things that we've been studying extensively through this pandemic because it is something that we've seen come out in droves. And it's always, you know, who said that Mr. Rogers or something? Well, whenever something's happening, look for the helpers. And that's yep. what we've seen a lot of through this is yes, there's Uh, death and destruction everywhere. And this virus is still running rampant. But you know what? We've seen more people uh, creating food drives and shelters for the homeless and uh, GoFundMes for communities to continue to support each other. There are still people that are focusing on compassion and that, that light and love that has changed our literal cellular capacity, our structures in our bodies as to how we function throughout the day. And all of this positive, all of the positivity is really uh, something that we're finding leads to, as well as with gratitude, leads to better sleep. Maybe I ought to stay off Twitter then. Because yes. I- <laughs> 
I'll second that. <laughs> yeah, Twitter doesn't make me compassionate or empathetic. It's just it really drag, doesn't, you know. <laughs> it drags me. You know, in fact, it it all social media. I've I've cut it all out. And I, I'm sleeping pretty good. It's true. Not even just the physiological aspect of the blue light, which I know we discussed last time, uh, but oh, yeah. the devices that we use all day, every day now, uh, just especially through work from home. We are on our laptops for hours out of the day. Our children are learning on devices, iPads and, and everything. So that influence is impacting us. It's impacting our bodies, which then impacts our sleep. So taking a break, even if it's just for the two hours before bedtime, is not only going to be helpful, but it's going to be a game changer. People, two. I've literally had people say after, you know, two nights of not looking at my phone before bed, I'm sleeping like a baby. So two hours before bed, you're supposed to stop looking at the blue screens? Yes. I always joke, I'm not a, a monster. I say an hour. The National Sleep Foundation says two. You do you. <laughs> but I will say this. If you start with an hour, it's going to be pretty easy to do two. You will very quickly see a positive impact on your sleep by that first hour. Um, and, you know, you can just kind of work your way up. It's not all or nothing. We don't have to be perfect with our sleep practices. Just try some things and see what works. John, did you hear that? Yes. So, Sarah, he did change some of his bad habits after he spoke with you last year. Wonderful. And now he's back in those bad habits. Oh, you know, <laughs> this is why. So, you know, I mainly do corporate sleep education. I work with companies and teach employees about sleep. Mm -hmm. And the majority of my clients bring me back every year. So if they have a large number of teammates, that's great. They get their sleep education and they're all gung-ho for a few months and then it starts to dissipate. And that's just fine because eventually when you hear it enough times, it will stick. So yes, a lot of my clients are annual clients. It's time to bring Sarah back in to let us hear it again. Bring her back in. Well, and, and along with that shameless plug there, I do want to say that <laughs> it's true though, because uh, Sarah came and talked to a um, my company, uh, North or National Partners in Healthcare last year, is the most popular thing we've had last year. Um, it really struck because, it, you know, it's so relevant to people. Everybody, everybody has to sleep and thought that your your talks were great. And we do need another refresher because it does get back to this point where there's only so much more you can do for your employees to give them um, some sort of we're not saying work life balance, trying to it's like a healthy work life. And if, you know, ultimately it comes down to we have to take care of ourselves too and to teach well, people how to do that. And to a, a new point that we've never been before. So we've always known, you know, care for yourself or care for your employees. Uh, employee wellness programs are important for people to feel valued and really want to commit and be loyal to their company. But we've gotten to a new level with COVID because we have literally collectively as, as the human race have had to care about our wellness all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first week when you got your groceries and we were wiping everything down with bleach and it was just the, the panic that set in with the start put a focus on the wellness of our bodies that most of us have never been through before. So it's really almost kind of a natural byproduct to say, you know what, we have been continuing to work through this. We've been continuing to do our best and we are very adaptable as humans. We've been doing a great job, but we do have to now move forward and say wellness is still going to be a priority. And I can't wait to see what companies and corporations do with this once people start going back to the office. I'm advocating for napping spaces everywhere. Oh, oh I love that. You, but you, go ahead, babe. No, great point here on, on, on focusing on wellness. I think that's what's been missing in the... Uh, in all that's been thrown at us in the last two years, it's it's been a focus on vaccinations and boosters and masks, no masks, what, why, wipe things down. But really, the focus all along should have been on wellness and everything from supplements to sleeping habits to you know um, whatever whatever things that we can in, improve in our lives. And you know, we talked about this last year too, Sarah. That that this the I think the stats now on those that were hospitalized or died from um, from COVID, 76% were obese. And we talked about the uh, effects of obesity on, on sleep as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when we think about wellness, it is really collective. It's not diet and exercise. It's not sleep and diet. It's, it's a collective, these three pillars of health. And the outcomes, sadly, the comorbidities attached to the negative outcomes of COVID uh, of COVID are very much associated with 
poor health. So when we mm-hmm. focus on on wellness, you know, hopefully we're able, and of course that's not to discount the outliers. There have been perfectly healthy people with uh, the best diet, exercise, and sleep regimens that you could see who have lost their lives to COVID. And I am not discounting that at all. But numbers wise, what we're seeing statistically are uh, the people who have other issues like um, diabetes, obesity, uh, heart problems that are considered more vulnerable communities exactly because their wellness is reduced from these other issues. So yes, a focus on wellness can only help not only through this, but literally as we now attempt to continue moving forward and hope these variants stop popping up, we do need to continue moving forward, uh, caring about our overall wellness to just lead the longest and most healthy lives that we can. Yeah. Can I ask a basic, basic question? What what is, how does sleep affect uh, your immune system? Like, I, I I mean, your, is it, I mean, I would assume that it strengthens it, but what's the reason? So the reason is while we are sleeping, that's actually when our immune system goes to work. Now, our immune cells are used obviously to fight off virus and bacteria. This is how we remain healthy. While we're sleeping, our immune systems develop either what we call the sticky or bounce factor. Now, we actually want our immune systems to be sticky, despite the fact that it feels kind of counterintuitive. Now, when it's sticky and we take in virus or bacteria, we have to come in direct contact with it to kill it, to fight it off. So when we have our immune cells nice and sticky, we take something in, they stick to it, goes to battle, and then boom, dead. Awesome. That happens with sleep. So if you are sleep deprived, if you are not getting as much sleep as you're supposed to, you're going to develop the bounce factor. So you take in a virus and bacteria, it goes to battle with your immune cells, and it'll bounce off, becoming free running in your system. And that's how we become infected with not just COVID, but, you know, the flu or the cold. So the longer we sleep, the more sticky our immune system becomes, the better chance we have at fighting off virus and bacteria. You know, that that is that is really interesting because I've heard, and God knows his name's so uh, uh, flammable right now, but Joe Rogan, you know, he got mm-hmm. COVID. And he, he tried to trace it back and he said, well, I think it was this night because he basically did an all nighter with a bunch of friends, drank a lot, just did the whole thing. And he goes, I let my guard down and that had to be, and you know, there's, there's gotta be some truth that I've heard that from people before. When you, when you get to a place where you're not at your best, I, I'd never heard of the bounce factor, but that makes sense. Well, it's the same as, right. Think about our grandmas who have always said, Oh, you don't feel well, get in bed. And here's some chicken noodle soup. Yeah. They may not have had the science behind it, but they knew rest was a vital part of it. And it's also the whole, if you have that immune system issue, if you are not sleeping well, think about those times in your life where you've been very stressed out. You've had a few nights of poor sleep. That's when we get sick. And most people mm-hmm. attribute that to um, kind of a, a lack of effort in maintaining vigilant against germs, but that's really not the case. When you are sleep deprived, because that immune system bounces off those bacteria, it really does uh, kind of, it's nature's silly way of saying, well, you didn't do it yourself, so now we're going to force you to sleep. Yeah. Here, here's your sickness, get in bed. <laughs> get in bed. You know, I mean, I'm blessed or cursed, depending how you look at it. I can, if I sit down still for five minutes anywhere, I can take a nap just at the drop of a hat. It's wonderful. These little cat naps. Uh, hopefully I'm not driving when I do that, but you know, it's, uh, it, it is the, the difference in getting sleep versus not and trying to fight through it is, is night and day. I lo- let me ask you something from your, like your scientific perspective, your opinion on this. All right. So we mentioned, um, our reserves, our surge capacity is best for acute situations. We, we definitely have a chronic situation now. Do you think that once we, and I, I think this, I hear a lot of this now, so I think this is becoming a, a, a popular narrative. This is no longer a pandemic. It's an endemic. We think this is just something, this is what I've heard. And I'm not a scientist, but this is something we're going to have to live with just like we have to live with the flu. Not saying this is the flu, but I'm saying it's going to be that kind of deal. We're never going to eradicate it. So we need to, it seems to me that we need to focus then, okay, on well, what's our best defense then, as opposed to, it seems like we're trying to, you know, vaccines and masks and all that, we're trying to prevent it and fight it and attack it versus building our fortifications internally. Do you think that once people become accustomed to the, just like we do the flu, people don't freak out about the flu. Um, It comes every year. It's more dangerous to our kids than this particular disease, but people have become so accustomed to it that we know our preventative measures and you get your vitamin C and you take care of yourself and you, you know, take your, what's the airborne stuff when you fly and all that stuff. 
do you think that we will that will make a a, a change in people's you know, their their storage their surge capacity storage when they just realize this is something I have to live with versus I'm just going to keep going because it's going to end. It's not going to end. Yeah. So it's not going to end. I think the only difference is that we still have so many unknown variables with COVID versus the flu. Mm. The flu has been around for so long that we've had the time to research it and we know how to uh, prevent it. We know the different vitamins and minerals we can take to give us that fortitude. With COVID, there are still so many unanswered questions. So of course, there's going to be that confusion and that fear associated with it. But I agree, this is not going anywhere. This is going to be a part of our you know, you get your yearly flu shots and you get your COVID vaccine. And the sooner that we recognize that this is never going away, the better it will be. Now, that being said, the leaps and bounds that the scientists and researchers have made in these last two years have been incredibly impressive. And I guess the best that we can hope for is that they continue to press on so we can learn everything that we can the same way they have with all of the other things that uh, were uh, epidemics and, and pandemics that really caused uh, a lot of death and, and heartache throughout uh, the different countries throughout the, you know, the history of time. Uh, I personally am hoping that we get to that point sooner than later because it is really difficult to continue to live this way. And again, that's not to discount uh, all of the hard things uh, and the loss that have come through these last two years. But it, for me, I feel like I know I can restore my surge capacity. I just don't want to have to keep doing it. <laughs> no. Now you're in Minnesota, right? You're in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. uh, and your kids, are they still doing remote learning? Mine is not, but different. it's different by county. You're right. Okay. Because I can tell you that that one factor made a huge difference in our, oh. our life. Uh, you know, our child, he was six. Our oldest had already graduated, thankfully. Youngest was 16 in high school when it hit that spring semester, it was just a disaster. So we did whatever we had to do to get him into a school where he could attend live. Um, knowing the dangers, we took the precautions and the schools were very good about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a real, I mean, the, the data that's going to come out of this years to come now about, you know, what's happened to our, our children remote versus people who went live and some of the restrictions, there's going to be some, there's going to be some psychological, I think, damage some people are going to have to deal with because it's just, it was so hard and it made it hard on the entire family. Once we felt better, okay, he's going to Cooper's at school. He's going to learn. Thank God, you it's know, because be I'm social. I'm not a teacher. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a teacher. <laughs> right. And we've seen a lot of interesting things in the realm of sleep medicine that came from distance learning and came from remote learning. Uh, just the influx of device use for children and their neurological patterns mm. and how it has negatively impacted sleep. And so, of course, you know, we're from the era of textbooks and our kids, they get iPads to learn. Uh, these things are going to advance technologically and there are pros and cons, uh, but COVID and children's sleep, it's been fascinating to see that, you know, there is something to be said for, okay, well, now you just have to wake up and hopefully change from pajamas to normal clothes and turn on your computer and go. And all of that's great because it reduces commute time. They don't have to deal with the buses and, and all that. So there is maybe more time allotted for sleep, but the quality of it is impaired based on constant technology use throughout every single home uh, all through COVID. Yeah, we're doing it to ourselves. You know, it's, it's funny because last year, this time, just about I'm trying to remember the exact dates, but because we have snow on the ground here now. We had our little winter storm. Oh, but we had, okay. I'm in Minnesota. So. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to even say it. <laughs> you did? Yeah. We don't know. But last you year did. we had that bad Texas storm where it was just, we, we were frozen. In I remember no power. your power was out. Yeah. Right? And one of the offshoots was, though, I mean, we, this sounds bad because, I mean, we lost a water cooler, we, our water heater. We lost a ceiling, all kinds of stuff. But we actually, as a family, had a pretty good time during it because we were all huddled together. We were playing games. We may have had a few cocktails at night, but we'd yeah. sled. We were, you know, there was nothing to watch. So, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we slept. It was. I slept so good. Oh my God. It was like hibernating so bears, you know, <laughs> we're in there when it got dark. It was like, okay, let's uh, go to bed, I guess. It's and been amazing. I don't think I've is. ever slept better. I know. I don't <laughs> think so. It was awesome. I mean, the sleep buried under the blankets and stuff. It was great think about that without the ability to turn on lights, watch TV, uh, keep yourself distracted. Like, all right, well, what else are we going to do? Let's go to sleep. 
we used to get to do that, but now we're so acclimated to our devices. It feels like you're missing something if you just go to bed. But those nights where you're like, all right, it's eight and I'm exhausted. I'm just going to do it. We feel so great in the morning. I don't know why we always resist. You know what? That's, that's true. And work because everyone knew about our situation here. So they left us alone. So I was that I probably, that's probably when I had my most natural, um, mm-hmm. you know, go to sleep, wake up, um, to the, to the, to the, you know, daylight, yeah. um, not an alarm because we couldn't turn, we couldn't turn our alarms on cause our phones were dead. <laughs> yeah. A happy Karen in the morning is an annoying one though. She's marching around the house. And ah, the house one of those. Around. Yeah. No, I'm not a happy morning person. <laughs> when you get your sleep, though, it's just horrible. It's like, <laughs> no, when I get my sleep, I'm I'm good, but I'm not perky in the morning. Ugh. I'm the one who wants to roll out of bed and get on the conference call three minutes before <laughs> it's supposed to start. You and me both. Uh, Sarah, you shared uh, one of the things that you shared on your uh, LinkedIn profile. It was an article, and Pauline Boss was one of the people that was noted in there. She was talking about this ambiguous loss that we have right now. We feel hopeless and helpless. Are you familiar with what I'm, I'm talking about? With the, yeah. the whole? Um, and it was really interesting because she was talking about this American. It might be really difficult on Americans, especially because we are really solution or solution oriented and we're really thinking of ways to fix it. We, you know, that's just kind of how we are. So we're almost fighting against this and it's, and it's not good for us. It's not good. Another thing to note in that realm is that collective trauma has happened. Whether or not you have lost Mm -hmm. a loved one to COVID, we have all lost so much through these last two years. And your strength does not mean you have not been through a traumatic event. That's not to say all of us having collective trauma is not an indicator about your resilience or your strength. This is just a collective thing that we have all lived through and it, it is a traumatic event. This is just not something that's normal. Uh, so yes, with Americans and our our problem solving and our solutions and our brains go to let's fix this and move on. It's incredibly uh, invasive. It feels invasive to all of our lifestyles. And then coupled with the fact that Americans really have a backwards attitude towards rest in general. Mm-hmm. You know, there are there are napping laws in Japan. There are siestas all over the world. Some parts of the country shut down from two to four so everybody can nap and then you come back and work some more. We as Americans do not respect rest the way the rest of the world does. So we have really kind of um, taken a, a major hit in having to uh, not only acknowledge those stigmas that we associate with sleep, but how to wrestle through them and really care for ourselves in that way. Well, and the loss, it, this is what really, it struck me too. She gave some examples of loss and you did as well, but you know, we lost our way of living. We had to, everybody, we had whatever your way of living was, we lost it. Uh, a lot of us, you can throw me in there, started to lose a lot of trust in what people were telling me. I mean, whether it's the media, whether it's the, whether it's Fauci, whether it's the government, whether it's whoever. I mean, there just seemed to be so many so mixed conflict. messages. Yeah. Yes. A lot of moving. A lot of moving part. A lot of, yeah, a lot of moving. And then we, we lost freedoms. We've never been through that before in America where we've actually had to, you will lock down or you will be Stay mandated. Yeah. And, you well, will have to do this right. or you will you will get a vaccine. I mean, mandates and freedom things, mandates of freedom don't jive a lot. So, and we've never to my, I mean, again, we've had some dark moments in our history, but Not since like my this. 50 years on the, on the planet, 50 plus years, we haven't had anything like that. And it was, it's bizarre. It's just not even in our DNA. Well, and not only that, just that and it's not universal. So everyone has their own issues and their own. So it could be different, it, different by state, by city, it is by different by yeah. state. That's exactly so it's such a good point, because at some point, then you just kind of think, what's the point? So here in Minnesota, we it was a very, very strict state when it came to COVID. Right next door, our border share of Wisconsin, different story. So <laughs> right. like, what's really the point? Because you can go back and forth and do things this way here and this way there. And it you know, it kind of negates everything, all the efforts. So yeah, I completely understand what you're saying, where it's like, you're getting information from different places. Everything's conflicting. Uh, There was no standard. There was no, you know, everything was just so, it was so strange. And I think that's really where we're struggling now is that it still feels the same way. It still feels the same level of ridiculousness because we feel like we should have moved more forward at this point. But with the variants, with the 
the changing, even with the weather changing, it changes uh, the transferability and ability to be infected. It's just, is, again, it's just never ending. Yeah, so in this article that, I, I don't know, did you send this article to John? I, I got it from your uh, your profile, your, your activity. I'm looking at your activity. Oh, stalking. <laughs> yes. Um, appreciating. <laughs> yes, appreciating. <laughs> so it says, begin slowly building your res resilience bank account. And it, the this doctor, is it Mattis? I don't know. Uh, am I saying Michael right? Mattis, Mattis or Mattis? Mattis? I'm not sure how you say it. but Yeah, the areas he specifically advocates focusing on our sleep, nutrition, exercise, meditation, self-compassion, gratitude, connection, and saying no. You know, that that's the silver lining for me that came out of COVID is that I, I have learned to say no to myself and to, I'm, I'm one of those people that I've been told I have an unnecessary sense of urgency. And so, um, so I, I, um, I have a hard time saying no and everything has to be done right now. But I found myself coming now on the other side of, of, of this, realizing that if I get, if I have too many things on my plate, I, I walk away. I step away. I've never done that before. I would just dig in and just fight through. And now I, I've, I've given myself the, um, I don't know, the, 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 permission, oh, the, the privilege, the yeah. permission, yes, to say, okay, you know what, that you don't have to do that right now. Step away, go for an hour and a half walk and, and come back and, and, you know, attack it with a clear mind. And I that's something that. I never did before. Good for yeah. you. I, I've seen all of these memes from the introverts saying, this is our time. Right. <laughs> yeah. you know? And that's great. I'm glad that some people feel uh, kind of that they could enjoy some parts of this chaos. I myself as a complete extrovert had a really hard time with it, but have found that I have changed in the last year as well, where now when I think about going back to life as it was before, I have included no in the conversation a lot more than I ever would before as well. So there, yes. we will find some positives after all of this. Yeah, Karen, if there's a lull in the conversation, she will volunteer to do whatever it is that you're, I just, anytime we're, we're at a group meeting, they're like, you know, we need somebody to volunteer. I'm like, oh no. I have oh, done no. a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, what are, that's not that what I, that's not, I need to say yes to more of those things, honey. That's being compassionate and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in fulfilling my need to socialize and it's all been in positive ways. That's a very um, common theme that we've heard these last few years from caretakers. That means you have a caretaking heart. There is something in you that despite the fact that you may want to say no sometimes, you are a human who has to ensure everybody else's happiness and comfort, and that brings you happiness and comfort. So yes. you very much do have that caretaker personality. See, John, it's good. He's just mad because I had my friends, my best friend Arlene's 50th birthday party at our house on his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> when was your party? See, no, there well, was no so party. wait, there was wait. No, <laughs> no, wait, stop. That's not true. So what happened was she ended up getting testing positive for COVID. So we had to move it back one week. Oh, so it yeah. actually didn't happen, but he was mad. And I told him he was selfish. <laughs> He's mad that I was going to have my friend who's turning 50. It's not like it was her 48th. It was her 50th right. birthday. Okay, so what birthday was yours? 56. 56. Okay, I'm with Karen on this one. Yeah, thank you. See, everybody <laughs> says that because they're trying and to be nice I, to her. Now Nobody I have cares no, about no, trying to be nice to me. I, am, I appreciate your kindness as well, but 50 is a big deal. <laughs> Yes, we we went to Vegas for years. You'll so. find out one day, maybe. No, it's it is a big deal. You know, and she does. Yeah, she she'll find out one day too. I'll tell you. I, I told her I go. I'm gonna have a poker game on your 50th birthday party. I'm just gonna invite a bunch of buddies over. There you go. Well, you got a year to plan it. Uh, now, I think that um, it was Boss to who uh, Pauline Boss who said uh, there were three steps to kind of get past this with the loss is you accept this new reality. You expect less of yourself, which I think goes totally into what we were talking about before. And this is what really, really rings true is you recognize the different aspects of going through grief. I mean, we are going through the grieving process in a sense because of the loss. Now, it's not maybe we didn't lose an individual. Like you said, we lost freedoms, whatever. Where do you think we are? Because, you know, there was denial. There was anger for sure. We saw that bargaining depression, and then acceptance. Acceptance is where we want to get eventually. We're obviously not there. Do you think because we've run out of reserves, are we in the depression part right now? I think we are in the depression part. I think we also cycled through 
once before and then we yeah. started over. We're on round uh, two. We mm. have not individually touched once on all of these things. We're on round two of depression. Uh, so when you think about, think of the skills that we all attempted to acquire during 2020. Everybody okay. was gardening. Everybody was baking <laughs> bread. Everybody was sewing, acquiring new skills. This is something yeah. that is also on that list saying uh, to not only grieve, but to find new interests, new hobbies that bring you joy. And that's another way to fill things up. And we did. We found all the hobbies. But now we can bake all the bread. Now we have these stellar right. garden beds and we didn't get anywhere else down that list. So back into the depression we are. That's OK. This is a part of the process of, of grief. And I think it's even stronger this time because we're grieving not only that we're still in it, but how close we got to being out of it. It felt like it was going to end it for did. a quick minute there. And that was exciting. Just kidding. This one's even more infectious. And right. so here, here we go. I think uh, the depression state is just fine, especially as we go through these winter months. Uh, you know, you've got your snow. We've got our tundra. <laughs> yeah, our and, snow, I think, was one and a half inches of dust, and we were terrified. Cute. It was like icing up and everything. Oh my God. Oh, companies uh, closed down. Like school was. Schools closed for two days before it ever got here. Yeah. They were, That's they did sweet. preemptive closures. That's adorable. I don't even really know what to say to that. I know. Adorable. That's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe it. Hey, I know the cure for uh, the cure for all this when you're in depression, and it's not more cowbell; it's pickleball. The cure yes. is pickleball. That's what we found. We're all over the pit. pickleball. Was our new activity that filled so many little, I, I guess, needs social and activity and outside, outside. and yeah. I had a strange one. Do you want to hear my yeah, strange one? Go. Sure. My new fascination is cemeteries. So oh <laughs> what? I know. <laughs> What does that mean? Wait, let's let her expand. <laughs> go on. Go on. So I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a land of 10,000 lakes. I'm in the heart of Uptown where we have a very great lake chain. Yeah, where, it's gorgeous there. Yes. But there we have a beautiful cemetery called Lakewood Cemetery. It's actually one of the most famous cemeteries in the country. I didn't know People this. are dying to get in there, right? Oh, my gosh. That's my joke. Oh, come on. That is my joke. I should have known. Dad's my joke. dad's joke. <laughs> yeah. My dad's joke. <laughs> he taught me. So we can it edit is, that out. it's just, don't, please don't. It's beautiful. <laughs> the lakes started to get busy because during COVID, people knew we have to be outside. Uh, so let's start activities. A lot of people were walking. So my beautiful empty yeah. lakes then were packed with people. So it was like, I might as well be inside somewhere. I had to find somewhere to go with less alive people. <laughs> so I ended up <laughs> walking. Funny past this beautiful cemetery and I went in the gates and it just, I found myself reading headstones and telling stories about who these people may have been. A lot of different oh. amazing people in our our state's history. We have a lot of uh, politicians and musicians and it's just a really cool place. And it just led me down this weird little wormhole of thinking instead of the fact that it could be construed as creepy, I just think it's beautiful and peaceful. <laughs> I think that's great. I do too. I that's, that's actually really, really cool because cool. I, mean, I, I don't hang out in cemeteries, but whenever you've gone for like a, a burial or whatever, and you look at all the tombstones, you start thinking of the people who, you know, hundreds of years ago were there. Yeah. And, and it's pretty wild. Yeah. It makes okay. you grateful for your, for what we have, even though we're going through this, at least we're still here to go through it. Absolutely. So what about this other article that you sent me in on the depths of sleep? Our brains are alert. To yes. Stranger spidey danger. sense. I've got I spidey sense. I, okay. Sarah shared this about a, I think it was like just over a week ago, two weeks ago. There was some about our brain has some, something called K complexes or something like that, mm -hmm. that picks up danger. Uh, so it, it is literally a, like it, we're used to, well, you explain it, Sarah. What yeah, is it? Like it's a physiological defense mechanism. So K complex is a specific brain wave that happens in stage two sleep. Uh, but our ability to still be aware of dangerous scenarios while we are sleeping is something that's newly identified. So when we think about sleep historically, in fact, until the point that we were able to read brain waves, people thought it was like a mini death. You basically you were out, you were pretty much dead until you woke up. Here's the hoping it happens every morning. Right. 
We were right. not aware of how much electric activity, how active our brains were in different stages of sleep until 1924 with the invention of EEG, the ability to read brain waves. So once we found that out and saw how active our brains were and that there were even different stages of sleep and that they all did very different things, that was an absolute game changer as far as the discoveries in sleep medicine. So now as we're getting into more and more deep research, we're finding, uh, yes, these mechanisms that lie deep within our brains in sleep that have helped to keep us alive for centuries that we're just discovering now it's so cool and like i know you joke and say oh i have spidey sense while i'm sleeping but how lucky are we that these things exist somehow mother nature knew you are going to be put in dangerous situations while you are inactive in this very necessary sleeping time and it is necessary our bodies do have to rest for these eight hours in a 24-hour period for ourselves to restore and for us to continue to be able to achieve wakefulness but that leaves us vulnerable. So to put those mechanisms in place, uh, as far as predators or, or other tribes, you know, throughout history to allow us to say, okay, I'm going to at least recognize somehow that this is happening and alert myself to this danger. That's so cool. That is so cool. That's, it makes me, it's going to make me sleep better too. Cause then I'll know that if yes. somebody, <laughs> if I'm in danger, my body will know it's out all, of it. Only if it's somebody whose voice is not familiar to you. So I can still sneak up on you. <laughs> So I still got that. See, this is why I advocate for separate sleeping spaces. For we are right we now. Do. We, we, we do. are right now. And that's why we're getting the best sleep of our lives. Exactly. I told you, that. you made it okay for us to, to be open about that. And so I, I world, can't wait. We are open about it because it's, it's made for a better marriage. It's made we, for everybody. I don't know why this isn't. <laughs> I seriously, I'm with you. I do have to ask you something on that, though. And this yes. is going to be a little rabbit um hole and then we'll come back but um what is how what is jimmy leg is that bad for him <laughs> i've got the jimmy legs <laughs> i told him this happens yeah I, I, when so when we have stayed together i was like I, I, i'll wake up in the morning and he's literally mm -hmm. i mean these uncontrollable movements that are just and and then i try to get him on film but as soon as i get to get the video going he stops so his spidey, it's my spidey sense. sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually incredibly common. So physiologically, it's not harming in any way. It's not going to be something you have to worry about is going to make any kind of health issues arise. Uh, it's kind of like a hypnagogic jerk, which we all do. A hypnagogic jerk is that sensation of when you start to fall asleep and then all of a sudden you go yeah. and you feel like yeah. you're falling and then you look around all embarrassed. We all do that. We all experience that. On the tail end, there's also a hypnopompic jerk, which is uh, with hypnagogic, it's with sleep onset. Hypnopompic is when we're waking up. So these are just what we call strange behaviors at night. The jimmy leg is, uh, again, something that people experience. It's not hurting you in any way, but like with all sleep issues, it's the bed partner that suffers. So don't have a bed partner. Okay, but it does help, but it doesn't hurt his sleep is no. what you're saying. Correct. Okay, that's good. Okay. And I told you I sleepwalk too, right? We we had this discussion yeah. before. Yeah, I've had a few more of those waking up in different rooms and all that, but still um haven't gone back outside, which that's, is good. <laughs> it's always a, a that's a plus. <laughs> now, have you seen there's a, you know, we're obviously we binge whatever we watch cuz we don't even watch TV so much as we watch Netflix or Hulu, yep, but same. there's some new show called uh, Dead Asleep. Have you seen that? It's a documentary on a sleepwalker that actually that killed his his wife or somebody it's a true story and so i'm like karen check it out check it out and that That's was not, not funny <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, i feel it's interesting it is interesting in fact we have in minnesota here something called the sleep forensic institute and these are some sleep docs and researchers that are able to use the sleep forensics to basically prove or disprove claims like that because so many people do things and say oh whoops I killed my wife, her head's in the trunk, but I was asleep. Sleep. Uh -huh. And now we have the ability to say that uh, we can prove if that's true or not. Wow. See, Thank in fact, okay. there was a case years ago where um, a man was on trial for rape. And I'm not sure if you know this, but for impotent men, they are unable to achieve erections. But for non-impotent men, all of the non-impotent men get erections in REM sleep. In that specific stage of sleep, you will get an erection whether or not you are aware of it. Uh, and that's what, you know, sorry to be vulgar, but morning wood. When men wake up, you yeah. probably Hey, 
This We're... show just reached a whole new demographic now. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. I love this. You were just in REM. It's not like you were having an exciting dream. It's just that stage of sleep. So this specific defendant was saying, it couldn't have been me. I'm impotent. So they actually did a test. It's called no nocturnal penile tumescence, where we're able wow. to see if an erection was achieved in REM sleep. And it was. He was lying. <laughs> Oh, wow. My God. So that I just learned so much right there in that last two minutes. <laughs> so he, he claimed to be somebody who had to sleep on the ground, but he could actually put up a tent. Is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, John. What? That's funny. Hey, we've Sarah took all the gloves off here. This is not me. I, hey, it's, it's science. It's, it's science. science. It is science. Uh, so I was, uh, I also wanted to ask you because you came up with this. It's when you're speaking to people now, and I know that, um, I want to make sure that we're reminding people you do speak to companies, you consult people individually. Um, it's the sleep industry is huge now, I guess, but it, it was, it sounded like such an odd thing to be a sleep scientist when we first connected over like a year ago is things must be developing rapidly. What right now, what is of most interest to you in your sleep science? I think, oh gosh, where would I even start? I'm a simpleton, and I think the fact that the general awareness, even what you just said, what you are more aware of after one year, that's really important to me. Because when I started working in sleep medicine almost 20 years ago, I would tell people, oh, I, I work in sleep. And it always went the same way. What? You get paid what? to sleep? <laughs> no. I help people sleep. And then they will ask me very intimate questions. And you know, it was always a very confusing thing. If I would say something like, oh, you know, they'd have their issues and, oh, well, yep, that actually sounds like sleep apnea. You should get checked for that. What? What's that? Is that that CPAC machine? And, you know, <laughs> everybody just, it was a very confusing science in general. So I think the thing that interests me the most is the fact that it is becoming as popular as it always should have been. It should always have been as popular as eating well. It should always have been as popular as working out. We just didn't have the technology to even figure out what was going on until the last 60, 70 years. And now that we know, it's so much cooler than we could have ever imagined. So yeah, I guess that's my favorite thing is people are starting to respect it the way uh, that we should appreciate it. And it's getting less and less cool to say things like, oh, we only slept three hours. Good for you. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll, right. I'll see you in that cemetery. <laughs> Next time I'm walking through. Right. Um, okay. I uh, We need some help here. John and I have a very good friend of ours. I was just Abe. about to bring this up. Yeah, we're going to name we're shame trying, him. Abe. Abe. You're out there on our podcast now. He's, see, he doesn't listen to podcasts, so we're going to get him. No, he listens to this, to this one. So, oh. I'm the only one he listens right. to. Well, but not. Not anymore. We need him. <laughs> we need him. We need him to really listen to this one. Okay. So he, we, we've heard for last year, um, his wife, Jackie, her um, frustration because Abe, they're, they're, they are sleeping in the same bed and Abe snores and he says he doesn't snore and they fight just like John and I did. And they don't have an extra bed for him to go to. So they're fighting through it. And we're telling him a CPAP machine. I'm telling you it's going to change your life. And what what can you say to convince him to, to make that step? So sadly, it's really difficult with male patients. Uh, and this isn't supposed to be you know funny. Neurologically, males and females are very, very different. Females, as we talked earlier, having that caretaker gene, we're the ones who reproduce. It's our jobs to not only make the babies, but then make sure they don't die. We have the ability to care, <laughs> to care about things in the way where the male brain isn't designed the same way. Male patients are so difficult to get them to understand that this is something that is going to be vital to your continued existence because their brains say, this is what we're doing right now. This is what matters today. And that's it. So I understand her frustration. It is very difficult to have those conversations with loved ones because a lot of times we just don't believe our loved ones in a way that we believe other people. For example, if I were walking through Target parking lot with my boyfriend and he was like, wow, you look great today. I'd be like, thanks. And if some strange woman came up to me and said, oh, you look amazing. I'd be like, oh my God, thank I you. I must look amazing. Yes. <laughs> I and look so good. Yes. And he's over there like, what the heck? I just, it doesn't, yeah. it's, not, it's not the same when it comes from a loved one. So my advice would be to have her seek uh, the help of a professional. Obviously I'm here for you uh, just to have this conversation so that it doesn't seem like it's a, a personal thing 
We're just talking facts here with that type of snoring, with that lack of breath. That does mean sleep apnea. What does sleep apnea mean? It means uh, your heart working overtime every night. What does that mean? Building plaque and stress. What does that mean? An eventual heart attack. So let's have a right. conversation as to how we're going to prevent this. Uh, and, you know, the, the wife doesn't have to be involved so she doesn't have to seem like she's nagging uh, because that is really a way that a lot of people feel. That's what we need to get him for his birthday as a consult. Well, if the if the heart attack doesn't get him, Jackie's going to get him. <laughs> She's about to kill him. No, it's the same way. We won't kill you because we're not. That's that's the part of. Did you not hear the nurturing? I mean, the nurturing, part, right? We won't kill you, but it does cause know. a lot of friction. Between... I think Jackie's. I think Jackie could kill him. <laughs> she's. You know tough. what? She's. She she's. Probably... She's a pick us She's never lost a battle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And she could get away with it by claiming sleep deprivation made her insane. Ooh, right. That's right. That's it, right. Let me tell you, it's legit too. Um, what else, honey? Um, the only other thing that I that, um, I was going to say in that article about the um, the K complexes or whatever, it mentioned um, how we sleep. We don't. You may not sleep as well in unfamiliar. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting, but, but, and I thought, gosh, I traveled all the time. Did I ever feel unsafe? And I thought that's that why hotels, you sleep so good in hotels. Cause you have a lock like that. Exactly. It's a very secure space. Uh, and even though it's an unfamiliar environment, you do know prior to bedtime that you've done what you could within those confines to keep yourself safe. And not only that, removing yourself from the stressors of your home sometimes is all it takes to say, okay, I can relax and actually initiate sleep. If you're at home, you know, there's a load of laundry that needs to be done. You know, there's a kid that's going to be pretending they're thirsty. You know that <laughs> there's a, the ability to just pull up whatever Netflix episode you were on last and check back in. So in those unfamiliar spaces, yes, of course, some people are going to feel a little uncomfortable. It may cause a less comfortable sleep, but for a lot of people, it's going to be some of the best sleep they're going to get. You know what? That's so true. Cause when I did travel a lot I, and you would say, why aren't you checking in on the kids all? And I was like, cause I'm away. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I would just be like, let go, take my hands off the mm -hmm. wheel and let you, you, be in control, John. I've even had patients say that in the sleep lab, covered in thousands of wires with tubes hooked up everywhere, wake up and say, oh, that was amazing. My kids weren't here. Free snacks. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sleep number bed. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I did one of those uh, take home sleep studies. You know, that's, yep. are those, you think those are legit? Absolutely. So HSTs or home sleep tests, we were mm -hmm. developing that technology prior to COVID because a lot of patients who have severe sleep disorders have other comorbidities as well. Some mm -hmm. so unhealthy that they can't even get into the sleep lab to get a sleep test. So mm -hmm. we've been creating these home sleep tests for years. So just having a, a real reason to really kickstart that, that generation of how many we were doing was great. Home sleep tests are really great for diagnosing sleep apnea. The technology in these devices, some of them are so small, you just put it on your finger uh, and just wear it overnight and it detects heart yeah. rate variability, oxygen saturations, respiration. We get so much information from these tiny little devices. So if you are not excited about going into a medical facility in the middle of a pandemic, a, a home sleep test is a great option. Yeah, because that was one of the things that I was like, okay. I mean, it, it's it's easy, right? I mean, you just you're sleeping, okay. I'll take it, then you send it in. So for for guys especially, like you said, they're reluctant, and that's another. It's like that's oh, a pain in the ass. I don't want to yeah. go to this thing and yeah. sleep and deal with people looking at me and we yeah, you do look it at, at you. <laughs> That's what, oh, that's what everybody thinks. Like you're up there just looking at us in the that's camera. That's what I picture. I picture no. this room with like with all these the one way mirrors and so, no. <laughs> so Look, we're actually me leg. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to keep you alive. We're watching the screens where your heart beats and every breath that you take, every tick down of your oxygen levels, every brain wave, every K complex and sleep spindle and theta wave that we see. And when you snore, we don't even hear it. When you fart, it's right over our heads. When you we, get a tent, they don't see it. <laughs> no, nope, like we're completely immune to all of that. There's nothing that you could do or say that we haven't seen. So when we think about strange jobs and people say, oh, I've seen it all, I can literally tell you I have seen it all. <laughs> I guess you have. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Sarah, how do people get a hold of you if they do want to tap into your expertise? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Just reach out to our website. Uh, the company is called Sleep Health Specialists or www.sleephs.com or just Google me. My name is Sarah Mo, and I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or you just Google Sarah Sleep. And luckily, uh, there aren't a lot of us. Oh, so you'll nice. Find me. <laughs> nice. Nice. You get a little, yeah, it's all about the branding, Sarah. Oh, my you gosh. I found it out from a Bumble date, and I, that's how I stopped doing Bumble. What's a, what's a Bumble? <laughs> Thing. what's that come on it's a sure. <laughs> it's a dating app so oh. i you know you don't put your last name on there but i i, I you were there asleep i went on a date with a guy and he said oh i saw you're on the news and i was like how you don't know my last name he said i googled sarah sleep oh that's so funny he's got stalker tendencies that, i gotta yeah, tell you right that now was my last, that was my last bumble date <laughs> Gosh, can you imagine if i could have done um, research on you before we got married? No. That would have been no, that would have been terrible. Bad. That would have been bad for everybody. I had to believe everything you told me. <laughs> take, yeah. take your word for it. <laughs> Boy, was I duped. <laughs> I'm just kidding, honey. <laughs> Well, like always, you're one of my favorite people to communicate with because you're Ditto. just you're you're open, you're you're so informative, and I and I really believe in what you're teaching. I really want to get you back out to my company and talk to our employees. They enjoyed it so much, mm -hmm. um, and you know your tips have changed our life in a positive way for sure. Um, I know that you know bedtime now is actually something we both we have our own little routines. We're not that's the other thing about when you have your own deal, you have your own routines. And you don't have to follow somebody else's routine or go to bed before you're ready. Yeah, and, and it that. doesn't irritate me right before you go to bed. Right. So you can God, go do you're it's so like a, annoying. It's, there, it's like a dog washing. that walks around in a circle before they sit, <laughs> they lay down. <laughs> 20 minutes to wash your face for God's sake. <laughs> I love this. And it's actually really, really great to be able to share that because your listeners are going to say, again, it's that giving permission. Okay, this is something everybody wants to have that space to have that alone time to have that ability to sleep comfortably and and it's just again so stigmatized although i think it was in 2018 the national sleep foundation did a huge widespread study and interviewed thousands of couples throughout the country and asked about their sleeping situations and so many of them said that we don't sleep together but please don't use our names Huh. I know. That's why I'm well, glad it, to be out there with it's this. It's a stigma about that must mean you're not intimate or you're not close or something exactly. like that. Something's and I can wrong. tell you, we're still ringing that bell all the time. Well, so I will say that I, I was I was going to say it without saying that, <laughs> but um, I was going to say we're closer now than we've ever been. And it's and it seems so weird because we're spending a lot more time together. And I, um, and but I really so you think we would be more annoyed, I think, with each other, but we're not. But but I think it's because of the sleep. I really, really do. I mean, he likes a dark room. I, I'm trying to keep up with my, you know, natural circadian, circadian rhythm and let the, keep the blinds open and wake up before my alarm with the natural light. And, you know, so those, like, even those little nuanced differences. Um, Absolutely. So that's just it. When you think about all the other differences when it comes to individuals or spouses or couples or bed partners, think of how one person might um, hate when you chew with your mouth open and the other one would never even notice that sound. Or there's always somebody who's all late or like on time is the most important. We have those differences for our preferences at night too. So why in the world did we think that we would get married, uh, stay married to one person and spend a third of our lives in a situation with them when you have completely different preferences for that time? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And I'm loud and proud about it, John. Yes. I'm glad you're <laughs> out there with me. That was Sadie Marie that came up and said hi. Oh. There she is. Okay, Sarah. Well, you enjoy your weekend and let's mm -hmm. let's check back in with each other again because you know, maybe we are at a turning point with this thing. There certainly is, you know, there, there's never a dull moment with it. But um hope I will tell people if you're thinking about having somebody speak to your company, Sarah's a slam dunk. Your your employees will love it. Uh, it, it is part of wellness that's ignored. I, I don't think I've ever been with a company before that ever said, and we want to help you sleep better because it's all about exercise. Um, it's not. And it was amazing how much feedback we got from our employees because they have kids that, that were having sleep issues or they were having sleep issues. And it was very helpful. So, so you're doing a great service. Do, do company wellness doc, uh, dollars uh, cover things like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So they do um, have resources put aside specifically for employee wellness programs. Yeah. Perfect. So there. Good to know. Well, anything Thank else you'd you. like to share with us today? No, 
Well, it's always a pleasure. Once we take another turn for the better or worse, uh, let's <laughs> chat again. I'll send you all the cool research that we're still doing and, and hopefully we'll all just uh, get through this together. Yes. All right, Sarah. Well, thanks so much again. Thank you, Sarah. Thank and, you guys uh, for having me. Anytime. All right. We'll see you soon. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.